Peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to the sixth season of Guerrilla Christianity. My name is Pastor Brett Walker, and I want to thank you for listening to Guerrilla Christianity, an unconventional, no apologies exposition of God's Holy Word. And right now we want to get right into God's Word, so let's go. Today's lesson is going to be in uh, the Old Testament. It's going to be in the first book of the New Testament, the first chapter of the first book, the very first page in the Bible that begins the Word of God. So we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 1 and going all the way through that chapter into chapter 2 and verse 4. And I'm going to be looking at it as we go along, so we're um, not going to read it right now, but we're going to go verse by verse through it. Because uh, we're continuing our examination of the Apostles' Creed, uh, that ancient creed, that statement of belief. It's not just for individuals. It's not just for each of us as Christians. I, when I recite the creed, I'm not just reciting the creed for myself, but I'm, I'm making a statement that I belong to a church that believes what I am stating. It's not just me. It's, this creed is for all Christians everywhere, and it is part of what unites us as one body of Christ. And so we're going to look at the second part of the, the, the statement on God. This week we're going to look at uh, God as maker of heaven and earth. So let us prepare our hearts and minds to receive this uh, word by uh, opening with a prayer. Let's bow our heads and pray. Uh, Eternal Father, we open our hearts and shut out the noise of the world so that we may receive Your Holy Word. Pour out Your Holy Spirit upon us that we may grow more in Your image day by day. This we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. So, creation. It's not a very controversial topic, right? (laughs) Creation. There are some schools in this country and around the world that refuse to teach creation. There are some schools in this country and around the world that refuse to teach uh, evolution as heresy. Um, Well, which is it? Is it creation? Is it evolution? Is it a mixture of both? What is is really the, the heart of the opening passages of Genesis? We read in the very first verse... In the beginning, now, Genesis, some different translations have taken certain liberties, and most of us know this first verse to go, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, period. For whatever reason, the uh, NRSV, looking at the tense of the verb created in the Hebrew, has rendered it this way, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, comma. Now, the punctuation, by the way, is not there. Punctuation is not inspired. What's inspired are the, the, the verbal words, the actual words in the Hebrew. There's no punctuation in the ancient Hebrew. There's no capitalization. There's no sentence end, no, no paragraph beginning or end. There's also no verses, no chapters. It's just one long stream of thought by the Hebrew pen. And so it makes it very difficult to translate these things in particular ways. The verses, or rather I should say the chapter divisions were added in the 15th century. The verse divisions were added in the 16th century for ease of memorization, for ease of remembering, to be able to say, Oh, what did, what did Jesus say in John 3.16? That's something that's meaningful to each and every one of us today. But if you went back to the 14th century and you held up a sign that said John 3.16, they'd be like, what in the world are you talking about? John 3.16, no, it's 2.14, you know? And my name's not John. So, so chapter and verse divisions are... A more recent construct, and again, it does make uh, make it a little bit difficult to translate the Bible from the ancient languages. In the fact that there are no verse divisions, 
there are no uh, chapter paragraph divisions. There's no punctuation whatsoever, no periods, no commas, no semicolons, no quotation marks. The translators add these things for our benefit so that we can read them. If we read this the way the Hebrew read it, or the Hebrew was written, it would be just one long stream of words, and it would be up to us to figure out where the divisions are. So, I'm okay with this translation. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth. Why? Because it's in the beginning. In the beginning of what? In the beginning of all things. In the beginning of everything. In the beginning of the universe, as it were. In the beginning of time as we know it. And so, the original writer of the book of Genesis, whom we believe to be Moses, is saying that before all things there was God. And without having to say those particular words, that's exactly what he's saying when he says, in the beginning, God. In the beginning of all things, in the beginning of all things, God created the heavens and the earth. Not just the earth. The interesting thing about creation theories, as it were, as it pertains to certain religions around the world, is that most of them center on the creation of the world and then the creation of people. Okay? And it's very limited in its scope. The Hebrew Bible, on the other hand, states that God created everything. That everything that came to be. In fact, what our statement of faith actually says is, maker of heaven and earth. Note that it does not say, maker of the heavens and the earth. But heaven, as, uh, as in a place. As in the place that God dwells. God also created that. But it's also a shortcut. To be able to, to say that God is the creator of heaven or maker of heaven and earth is to say that He made everything. Everything that can be seen and everything that cannot be seen. We are told in uh, Psalm 121, My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. To say we believe in a God who made heaven and earth is not an unbiblical thing. It's right in Psalms 121. The Lord made heaven and earth. In Job chapter 38, when God Himself is facing Job, His questioner, He says, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or, or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, Thus far shall you come and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. God was challenging Job. He's saying, you're, you're, you're asking me all these questions. You're asking me about me. Where were you? Where were you when I made the heavens and the earth? To paraphrase. So God is eternal. We are told He was there in the beginning. We're told that the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. And re remember that that word wind uh, is translated in other translations as a spirit. The Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. Why? Because the same word for wind is also the same word in Hebrew that is used for the word breath. And it's also the same word that is used in the Hebrew for the word spirit. The breath of God. The wind from God. The spirit of God. All the same thing. 
God said, let there be light, and there was light. Boy, that is, it's an important thing to know that when God commands something, even when it does not exist, it obeys His voice. Think about that for a second. There was no, there was no light. It was dark. It was only dark. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. He commanded light into being. He commanded all matter out of nothing into everything that we know of as the universe today. The universe is, is enormous. You know, I was thinking yesterday as I was uh, walking to my car, why did I park so far away? <laughs> you know, I, was, I came out of work and why did I park so far away from the door? You know, I was parking closer to the guard shack because I didn't want to walk that far. But then I, it's all the way as far as you could possibly park away from the door. This is a long walk. And yet that walk, <laughs> it's just, it's a, it's a tiny little thing. If I were to drive the same distance, or if I were to drive the same amount of time as I was walking, I would drive quite a considerable distance, maybe even an entire mile. Who knows? If I was flying in a plane in that same amount of time, I would have gone maybe a hundred miles. If I were, if I were flying in, in the space shuttle, which by the way goes an unbelievable speed, like 20,000 miles an hour. If I, in the same amount of time as it took me to walk from, from the front door of Amazon to my car, I would have gone about a thousand miles. Can you imagine that? Crazy crazy. But we're just talking about our planet. We're not even talking about the solar system. You know that we are so far away from our sun that it takes almost nine minutes for the light from the sun to get to us? Something, something cataclysmic could happen to our sun and it would take us nine minutes before we even knew it happened because we couldn't see it. And our sun is just one of about a billion stars in this galaxy. This galaxy, the, the Milky Way, which we've never actually seen because we, we only see it from the inside out. We can't see it from the outside in, but we have some pretty good ideas of what it might look like. Every picture you ever see of the Milky Way is just an artist's rendition of what we think it looks like because we have no idea. We have, I mean, they're, they're educated guesses. And <clears throat> this galaxy of ours is spinning, our sun is hurtling through the galaxy at 60,000 miles an hour, and our Earth is going along with it. And all the planets are going along with it. We're not stationary. We're not just spinning in one place. We're moving. We're, I mean, we're really trucking through the universe, if you think about it. Well, not the universe, this galaxy. Because if you, if you look at the universe as a whole, it probably doesn't even look like we're moving at all. And our galaxy is just one of literally billions of other galaxies. Do you know they once pointed the Hubble telescope at a point in the, in the space, for lack of a better term, and they left the aperture open. They had it pointing at one particular spot where they said, there's nothing there. They, there's nothing visible there. They pointed it at that spot. They opened the aperture for two months, 60 days, to get a full exposure, to gather in all the light that they could possibly get. And when they developed this picture, you know what they found? All you have to do is go and Google the Hubble Deep Space Exposure. It's, it's incredible. It's like, in one little picture, thousands upon thousands of galaxies it's, it's, it's mind-numbing to think about how really enormous this universe is. And God spoke and commanded these things to be, and they were. There was nothing there. God spoke into nothingness, and out of obedience, everything popped into being. Now, the atheist would tell you that all of the universe came out of a single point. All of the matter of the universe was condensed into one little 
point and because of the incredible energy contained there, it exploded outward. This is what we call the Big Bang. And they can describe down to the hundredth of a second what happened in that first second and how everything was formed. But what they can't account for is where did all that matter come from that was condensed in that single point? Where did it all come from? Because it's a basic axiom of physics that matter can neither be created nor destroyed. We've tried. We've tried. We, we've smashed atoms together and burst them apart, but the particles that they were made of still exist. They're not destroyed. They're still there. So where did everything come from? There has to have been a cause. Now the new, the new thinking is that, well, our universe is eternal, okay? That this isn't the first time that the universe has existed. It's, it's collapsed on itself and expanded back out and collapsed on itself and expanded out infinite number of times. It's still, you can do that all you want and you can, and, and you can just melt people's minds with that because it's really hard to grasp. But you're still not explaining where everything came from. There has to have been a cause. There has to have been a beginning. The Hebrew Bible tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Which is harder to believe? That everything came out of nothing? Or that God created everything from nothing? People will argue all day long about whether the first chapter of Genesis or the second chapter of Genesis is the true creation account because they don't seem to mesh. But in the end, the central point of the beginning of the Bible is this. God made everything from nothing. And if God could do that, there is nothing that God can't do. And so I want to go back and revisit this word, Almighty. As last week we looked at God the Father Almighty. We talked about His holiness last week, but we didn't talk about how He is powerful, all-powerful. And remember that these creeds, these creeds weren't written in English. Okay, These are ancient creeds, and they were originally written, written in Greek. And the Greek word that we have translated as Almighty is Pantocrator. Pantocrator, which means all ruling. All ruling. He rules over everything. That means everything that He commands happens. And we've seen that in Genesis. That when God spoke, He said, let there be light, and there was light. Can you imagine that? Now, sometimes as a joke, you know, if the fuse blows, you go down to the basement, you go to the broken circuit breaker, and you go, let there be light, and you flick it on, right? <laughs> you really didn't do anything. You just turned on the switch. But God created light out of the darkness. God saw that the light was good, and He separated the light from the darkness. He called the light day, he called the darkness night, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. A lot has been said about these days, about whether there were six actual days, or whether the days are an analogous or if they're uh, an allegory. God later on in Exodus, when He's giving the Ten Commandments to Moses, He says, for... In six, this is uh, Exodus chapter 20. Uh, Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son, your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or alien resident in your town. Then he says this, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Now he did that as an example for us. Certainly when Jesus walked among us, he did many things for our example. 
He washed the feet of his disciples. And he said, just as I have washed your feet, and I'm your master, I have washed your feet, so you should wash each other's feet. God did this as an example for us. Four and six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Jesus later on said that the Sabbath wasn't made, or the man wasn't made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. There is a wisdom in resting one day in seven. Even Amazon understands that. You're not allowed to work more than six days in a row if you work at, if you work at Amazon. Did you know that? That's an interesting thought, isn't it? There are some people who would work every single day if they could. I'm not one of them. <laughs> I need my rest. Believe me, I know I need my rest. But there is wisdom in resting one day out of seven. Did God need the rest? I don't particularly think so. I think God could have been working every single day of his life or every single day of all of eternity and it wouldn't wear him out. He did it for us. Man was not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath was made for the man. So God is Pantocrator. He is the ruler of all. What he commands happens. All of the universe both the material and the spiritual. Now, this is important because we are, we, we are saying that He is maker of heaven and earth. He's not just maker of earth, the, the material world, but He's also maker of heaven, the spiritual world. And this brings me to uh, the Gnostics. In the second century, there was a sect of Christians that arose called the Gnostics. Their, um, their name meant that they had a secret knowledge and that if you had this secret knowledge, that you could then be saved through that secret knowledge. And their uh, belief was that the material world is entirely corrupt. It's bad. It's very bad. It's so bad, in fact, that they said that it's impossible that God could have been made in human form. That he, that there's no way that God would have come to earth as a physical man. That Jesus had to have been a spiritual being because the spiritual is what is good and the material is corrupt and God could not be corrupt. Therefore, I mean, you see how this progression of thought takes you down the rabbit hole that leads to ultimately heresy. And that's what they believed. They believed in a heresy. They believed in a heresy, like Marcion. Marcion was also in the second century. He was the son of a man who was a bishop. And he, notice how carefully I said that. I don't like to say son of a bishop in church. So, <laughs> he was the son of a man who was a bishop. And he said, <laughs> sorry, couldn't waste that joke. It was too good. So, he had this crazy idea, and I say crazy, well, to him it wasn't crazy, and to his followers it wasn't crazy, that the God of the Old Testament was not the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What? Wait a minute, wait. So there was another God? Yes. That the God who created the material world, which is corrupt, borrowing his idea from the Gnostics, that the corruption came because this this was this it was an evil god named Yahweh, <laughs> right? That this evil god named Yahweh created the material world against the will of God the Father of Jesus and our, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and so Jesus came to right the wrong that Yahweh had created in this material, corrupt universe. It's silliness. And there's one phrase in Genesis that debunks both of these. The material world is not inherently corrupt. God did not make something that was corrupt. It says in verse 31 of chapter 1 that God saw everything that He had made and indeed it was very good. God saw everything that He had made, 
And indeed, it was very good. So what this phrase, the maker of heaven and earth, came about to combat was this heresy that the material world is corrupt and the spiritual world is good. And so we have to be freed from our material bodies in order to join God in the spiritual world. That's what the Gnostics and Marcion believed. They said that God, one God, the God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New Testament. God the Father Almighty is the maker of heaven and earth. And because He made heaven, the spiritual world, and earth, the material world, and He called them good, He rules over all of it. And that's where we get that word, pantocrator. Pantocrator. Now, when it was translated into Latin, that word became omnipotence. Omnipotence, which means all-powerful. Notice the difference. He's not the ruler over all things. He is all-powerful. It's a slight difference. But sometimes when we think of God, we think of Him as omnipotent, all-powerful. We don't think of him always as ruler over all. But he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And everything that he created is his, including us. Including all the material that went into the building of this church. Including the asphalt on the roads and the air that we breathe and the water that we drink. The, the wood that went into the houses that shelter us. He created those trees. In fact, the, the architect who designed the house that you live in, maybe it was you, I don't know. My grandfather built his own house, right? But the architect who designed the house that you live in was created by God. His intellect was was stirred his brain was made or his or her brain i should say was made and created by almighty all powerful ruler over everything god and so when we declare our belief in god the father almighty maker of heaven and earth what we are really saying stating is that god rules over everything because everything is what He made. And so as we come to communion, let's consider this for a moment. Jesus broke bread that was made from stalks of wheat that He created. He he blessed the cup of wine, the grapes on the vine of which He Himself created. He gave them to His disciples, descended from the first man that was made from the dust of the earth, whom God breathed life into. And the same hands that He created, the same trees that He created were made into the cross that He was nailed to. The iron in the nails that He created were driven into His hands for our sakes. Because when God created everything, He saw everything that He had made, and indeed it was very good. Unfortunately, that's not the end of the story. And next week we're going to look at Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. And we're going to look at what He did for us, even when we turned our backs on Him. But let us pray. Father God, we thank You for this amazing creation that You have given to us. You told us, be fruitful and multiply, subdue the earth. And this we have been doing. God, forgive us for any time we have ever abused Your creation. God, forgive us for any time that we have ever used Your creation for our benefit to the detriment of others. God, forgive us for ever thinking that the things that we own are our own and not from You. Because You made everything. Because You are the Maker of heaven and earth. 
You are God the Father Almighty. And as Almighty God, we bow down and worship You today for the mighty things that You have done, for the many ways in which You have blessed our lives, for creating us. Yes, but Lord, You didn't just create us and then walk away and leave us to our own devices, but You are in our lives today. What an amazing God You are. And so we bless Your holy name and we lift You up and we thank you, Lord, for, for showing us the miracle of creation and all that you have done in us, through us, for us, and in your name's sake. May you receive all glory, honor, and praise. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Guerrilla Christianity. My hope and prayer is that this time of listening to and learning from God's Word has blessed you as much as it has blessed me putting this message together. Now, I have been blessed that God has called me to minister to two churches in rural New Jersey, Ebenezer United Methodist Church in Auburn and Hudson United Methodist Church in Pettertown. And if you don't have a church family to call your own, I'd like to invite you to join us on Sunday mornings. We are a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching, Christ-adoring faith community in the heart of New Jersey's farmland. But if you don't live nearby, get involved with the church where you are. We are not called to be Christians in isolation, but in community. So I would encourage you to live out your faith with a group of like-minded believers where you are. Again, I pray that you have been blessed by this teaching, and I hope that you will join us again next time. God bless you and keep you. Amen.